Welcome to Campfire Football. Day two of the Euros is complete. I'm going to go over everything that happened, but obviously just going to take a moment to be grateful, happy that Christian Eriksen is responsive, looking well, looking like he's going to recover. That was horrifying, but we got to see what football is really all about. We got to see players banding together, showing their humanity immediately, showing whether it's fear, solidarity, strength, support. We got to see how players and fans come together from opposite teams. This, these, these were beautiful images for us in a moment that was absolutely grotesquely horrifying. Anyone who watched that today, it, those are difficult moments. And so let's all enjoy the fact that after two days of the Euros, a player who almost left us, it seemed, is still around and the games can continue and hopefully heal this wound from this weird traumatic event we just experienced. So I will get to the Christian Eriksen situation a bit because there's a lot of talk around it and I don't think there's an enormous amount to say, but I do have a few ideas I think that might be worth considering and a few props I want to hand out as well. But overall, look, we're off and running. The Euros have begun officially. It was a really, really special feeling to watch that opener between Italy and Turkey. I'm sure being in Rome, being in the ground must have been out spectacular for the fans because this feeling has been long awaited, right? I mean, it's Euro 2020 being played in 2021. I thought that's kind of funny how everything is, they had to keep with the branding of Euro 2020 because they probably spent so much money piling into that. But I enjoyed watching Italy. I thought that they they played with really good quality and intensity. And honestly, maybe the game is over after the national anthems because the Turks, you know, they looked all right, you know, ready and a little bit nervous. Maybe the Italians were singing and belting out their national anthem. True to form, they do this. But this was, you know, you just kind of got the feeling of intensity and, and how jazzed and hyped and just ready they were to go. And they were really good. They They scored three very, very good goals. Um, more or less in the lead-up. I'm not saying all the finishes were good. One's an own goal. But th they were very good, Italy. They controlled the game very well. I thought Jorginho was spectacular by himself in the midfield. Immobile and Insigne's interchanging and finishing was very good as well. So I thought Spinazzola had a great game. And you also got to see a little bit of that, bon you know, Chiellini makes a tackle to deny uh, Borac Yomas a chance to shoot. And, you know, he gets up and he just like roars because, you know, he loves to make tackles and he loves to defend. And, and you got to see that from Italy, this sense of identity. And that was really good. So uh, Italian fans should be really, really optimistic. I, I would imagine they're not going to get carried away because it's kind of hard to just get carried away with a team that is good. But you don't really, you're not 100% certain of how every game is going to go in terms of whether they're going to dominate or not at this current juncture. They may be on the way. So, great stuff, Italy. Turkey, though, pretty disappointing. They were very cagey in the first half, and I guess it, it was probably part of the game plan. That makes sense. But my issue was in the second half when they tried to open up a little bit more, they did it very poorly. They started making a lot of technical errors. They were not holding the ball for long stretches of possession. And they ended up making mistakes, and Italy kept creating good situations good combinations and areas to to get the ball into the dangerous area into the penalty area and then eventually right you just play the odds you get an own goal and then the final goal I think was actually a great way to just encapsulate what was going on because Immobile's the, the second Immobile tap in again it was the pressure was starting to pile on but the third one is to me was just the way the game really went it was Turkey make a bad make a bad error and Italy turn on the style in order to punish them and if, if this is the Italy we're going to see this tournament, they will definitely go a long way. They will go a long way. They could make it to the semis of the final. They could win it. Who knows? But th this was really encouraging if you're an Italian supporter. So one thing I also want to mention, that first half there was a handball shout from the Italians, a call that we've seen given in penalties throughout the season. And I was really happy to see UEFA come out you know, that UEFA has clearly taken a stance on this, that these are not going to be awarded. Um, here in the United States, we had Mark Clattenburg actually on the coverage. 
And he was talking about sort sort of aiding and understanding what some of the calls were. And he was like, it's the, you know, the, the, it's a biomechanical movement. It's natural. The ball hits his arm as he's moving. He's two yards away from it. No penalty move on. And I think that's great. That's what we want to see. We don't want to have penalties that suck, right. That no one agrees with be given and then you know the stakes are too high in a tournament like this and so I, I think that was really good so Italy sets down a marker and Turkey were disappointing that's that that's my takeaway from this game I think tur- Turkey will need to really come back with a lot of intensity I'm hoping that in the next couple games against Wales and Switzerland they just play more like themselves honestly they didn't really look themselves now Wales and Switzerland both actually looked decent I think Switzerland looked as they should have the better team against Wales, and I think they threw it away. They they took a lead in the second half from Mbolo. They probably should have scored in the first half as well. They needed to get the second because Wales were always going to pose a threat on the break. Wales is always going to pose a threat on set pieces. So you need to get that second goal because I don't think Wales were ever going to score twice today. And... Look, Wales are going to be heavily reliant on the pace of Daniel James on the break. Gareth Bale, obviously, to be a game changer. Aaron Ramsey to be able to control the ball, hold it, bring people into possession, and just be a tempo setter. And then, obviously, they're going to need Kiefer Moore as that aerial threat, which he was today. Excellent set piece. Really, really good set play. The way the way they put it together, the way they designed it, clearly off the training ground. Very good header to equalize at 1-1 after Mbolo had scored on a header on a corner, which, by the way, Horrible defending. Um, you, if you're not looking at the ball and you're just grabbing the dude, he doesn't need to jump in the air to head it. He just needs to make sure it hits him. That's what Mbolo did, and so yeah. But overall, I, I think that this is, it, it was very good for Wales to get that point. They are in a great position because of it, and the reason why is four third place teams will get out of the group. So you get four points, and, and I mean that really does put you right in the driver's seat in terms of being able to get out of a group. Obviously, for all these teams, you know, Italy is going to be the most difficult one, but if you can get a draw against Italy and you can win your other game, there's a really, really good chance. So Switzerland, Wales, I think they've got plenty they can still fight for, obviously, having just picked up a point, but they've got to watch out because Turkey has no room for error anymore. Turkey needs to pretty much win their next two games if they have any prayer, because they have to beat these. These are the opponents that they're going to be going against for second or third spot. Uh, moving on. Uh, I think that when once Group B started, we started to feel like, okay, the tournament is really going right now, okay? And I was very excited because Denmark versus Finland, it was going to be you know, cool little Northern Europe, Scandinavian affair. Finland in their first Euros, and they've got some players that can make a difference. And I, I the teams like this, similar to the way Iceland was, they're going to be very collective. They're going to play with a genuine sense of understanding. And I, I was watching this game at the, the first 45 minutes, and one thing that stood out to me was Denmark. Look, it, if Nicholas Bentner had been a better goal scorer, they would have had an era where we would have seen them go further in tournaments. Previous to him was Yondal Thomason. Previous to Yondal Thomason, they had Eva Sand, Michael Laudrup, goal scorers. They don't really have one right now. And it showed in the second half of the game when they finally went back to playing that they, they couldn't. It was really, really difficult for them to score, right? Uh, before I come back to that game and talk about what happened with Christian Eriksen, I just want to move on quickly to the Belgium-Russia uh, game because... <laughs> Funny enough, I forgot that Russia were actually playing this game at home. So when I was talking about my predictions, I was like, well, let's see how good Russia is away from home. Well, at home against Belgium, they were not good. Uh, The mistakes for the goals, ugly. Lukaku loved the little message um, into the camera after he scored his first one. Second goal that he scored was terrific. Uh, Thomas Meunier comes on as a substitute. For K- Timothy Castagna, who goes off with a head injury, he comes on the field, scores a goal, and then assists Lukaku's second goal. I thought it's not bad from Thomas Meunier. I mean, this is what you need. You need for random players to come off the bench and make an impact in a tournament like this, especially Belgium, who Kevin De Bruyne didn't play today. He's still recovering from his injury. Eden Hazard got 20 minutes, but you know, Eden Hazard's not the player he was in 2018 at the moment. He's he's still got to rebuild a lot of fitness and and confidence. So. 
look, we'll see. But that that game was a damp squib in the sense of how it felt. You could just it didn't really have a whole lot of um, real intensity, and I'm sure it was weird for most of the Belgian players who a lot of them have played with. Christian Eriksen, and then, you know, I mean, for all the players. I mean, you know, can't can't for one second think that the Russian players were not shocked and horrified by this because it happened two hours before they were meant to play. Seeing a fellow professional, and honestly, a living being, you, you see an animal collapse and you start to have internal reactions. This was This was something else. And so when we talk about this situation, I think one of the most important things is we we really do not jump on trying to blame anything or anybody for how this whole thing rolled out. There's only one group of people that I'm going to give a little bit of extra flack to, and we'll get to them in a minute. But overall, when something like this happens, this is where we find out how humans really work. I remember when Mark Vivian Foe collapsed, and I believe it was 2003. Um, in the Confederations Cup semifinal, playing for Cameroon against Turkey. Uh, I was in a cafe with my sister. We were in Paris. We were going to go to the France-Turkey game. And we see on the screens that the Cameroon's playing before us. Um, and we're watching Cameroon playing, and we're like, oh, I'm like, what's going on here? There's a guy who collapsed on the field. Like, We didn't really know. We got our food went to the stadium, and when we were there in the stadium, there was a huge, on the big screen, they said, we're going to take a minute's silence for the death of Mark Vivian Foe. And that's when I realized, I like looked at my sister, I was like, he died? I couldn't believe it. You know, I was uh, maybe 14 years old and 15 years old. I was just in shock about this whole thing. And then you're looking at the players, the French players on the field, guys in tears. Uh, Roger Le Maire, the coach at the time, totally just a wreck it was a really sad situation and, and, and really a shocking thing for me. Then there was Miklos Feher, a Benfica player who, a Hungarian guy, collapsed at the end of a game, didn't wake up. Uh, and then, of course, there was Antonio Puerta in, uh, in, in Sevilla. Those were the three main situations like this that got me just concerned about cardiac arrest. I just I didn't understand how people like this who had no... No pre-existing condition, nothing that showed up in any way. There was no reason watching the game to think that they had overexerted themselves in a moment there. It was just, it's just something that happened. And just horrible, sad incidents, right? Now, Taylor Twelman on the American coverage on ESPN, he mentioned that it took over a minute and 40 seconds for the CPR to start from, from the medical official, officials. Now, that's a really, really long time. Um Anyone on the field could see that once he collapsed, it was an immediately difficult situation. But here's the thing. That's not easy for medical people, right? They The first thing happens is you have to be notified of it, right? In the chaos of all these players, someone goes down. Maybe you didn't see it. Then all of a sudden there's someone waving, hey, hey, come over. And so you look up and it's maybe the physios who are going to go first. But then you realize, oh, no, they want like the hospital. They want you know, medical, the whole medical crew to come. This takes a little bit of time. And the thing that's scary about cardiac arrest is the longer and longer you're out, the more brain damage it does to you. So, you know, th th this was a very scary scenario to see a grown man in. Now, look, I am a coach of 12 to 15-year-olds. Uh, we talk about cardiac arrest at, at times. And I, I, I've been doing my, a master's program, and we talked a lot about what happens with cardiac arrest? And, and and it is really, really horrible because this happens to young people, to kids, more than it does to adults. Um, and a lot of the times there are reasons. Sometimes what coaches' own responsibilities can lead to this kind of thing. But with kids, you don't have a minute 40. I mean, it's before to start CPR. You have to do it right away. And so this got me thinking, watching this, like, it would be really good if more of the players knew what to do in this scenario. And I'm not saying that they should just take over and do all the medical stuff. But I wonder how many of the players are actually CPR certified and trained, right? From what we gathered, it sounds like Simon Kier, oh my goodness, um, reportedly stepped up legend now. I mean, this guy, this guy is a lifesaver. 
literally. Because apparently what he did immediately after Erickson went down is he went over, checked to see if he had swallowed his tongue, something that commonly happens with people who have a heart attack, especially when they keel over. And he tilted his head back and opened up his air passageways for the professionals to come over and start doing CPR. Um, that was That's a huge move, a huge move. And look, maybe it's because he has the wherewithal. Maybe he has been CPR trained. I also don't know if this is something that the players all have to do. I kind of doubt it because I've never heard of it before. And I think that that's something that's worth worth really talking about. Um, what kind of preventions we can put in place? Because, you know, for me, I'm coaching out of the field and I'm supposed to somehow know where the defibrillators are. Like, they may be 150 yards away from me. If I've got a kid on the ground who is not breathing and not responsive, I you know I I can't do that. I need someone to call nine one one while I try and do CPR, right? I'm recently CPR certified. I hope to God I never have to do this because watching those guys and what the effort they had to put in to get him back to life, basically. I mean, you have to be a very very good trained professional to do that, and you also have to have the stones about you think about this big props to these guys in a stadium packed with people in this environment cameras of the world on you you do your job correctly you clear your mind well and i'm not saying that of course they, they these guys are thinking oh my god i'm on tv this is a crazy occasion but the pressure's there you know you, you can't get away from from understanding and knowing it and so huge props to everyone involved in trying to make sure he got well and then to the players man the scenes of the team locking arms, banding together, creating a shield. Now, here's what's interesting. They were not creating a shield behind them. If you watch these pictures, they are, they are not protecting away from the, the crowd behind. They are blocking the TV cameras. And that is a message that the broadcasters and the production people just did not pick up. And if they did, they were like, we don't care. We're still filming you. While this was happening, I started to ask myself, look, it's two minutes before halftime. Just call halftime. Now, now, get the Finnish players off the field. Get the rest of these, get, get players off the field. Cut back to the, ooh, cut back to the, <laughs> just knocked my mic there because I'm swinging my arms around because I'm all fired up. <laughs> get, get everyone just stopped for a second. Um, you know, like I said, send, send the, send it back to the studio, maybe with like a little picture in the corner hovering that shows that, that what they're doing. And if, you know, he's able to get up and sort of what's going on in the crowd, but this whole thing of zooming in and then especially zooming in on his wife, his partner. And look, I know she came down to the sideline, but people like this is not something that everyone should be watching. And it, I mean, it hurt me to see Casper Schmeichel and Simon Kier over there hugging this woman while she is fearing the absolute worst. It kind of reminded me of uh, what happened in Formula One last year with uh, Romain Grosjean when he went through the barriers and his car literally exploded. Um, his family's there watching, like, they, you know, what's going to happen? I don't want to see the people closest in that state. I, it's and I don't think that that was right by the by the producers. I think that there is a certain point here where you need a little bit more decorum, and then then the big question was, you know, what, what should they play? Look, this now has been I think well enough spoken about uh, in in the in the last couple hours. Basically, if you don't know, UEFA actually contacted both federations to talk to the players and, and coaches and staff and basically be like, what do you guys want to do? Obviously, I believe Finland completely just said, Denmark, we're with you no matter what. Christian Eriksen apparently at this point was responsive enough and said, you know, let the players know he'd prefer they played. The coach mentioned that it would not have been better tomorrow. They just wanted to get it over with. So anyone who wants to criticize whether this game should have been finished or not, let's just check that at the door. Stop. Just don't worry about this. Let's just be very grateful that we didn't lose a, a, an amazing player in person today. All right? Let's, let's go there. Then, if we want to try and fix things, 
understanding cardiac arrest can really, really help and knowing what kinds of things to do. Like I said, Simon Kier stepped up. He knew what to do in that situation just to give a little bit of prep, just to give a leg up to when the paramedics can get out there and actually help. These are the kinds of things that matter. I would say that having the conversation of how well-trained professionals are in dealing with these things, that matters, right? That matters, I think, for anybody. Uh, there was the situation in the FA Cup where uh, I think it was Fabrice Muamba went down, cardiac arrest, and a cardiologist who was in the crowd broke through the barricades where there was the stewards and the police and went onto the field to help him. It, 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 we cannot rely on those kinds of things. And at times we can't just rely on medical professionals because they sometimes can't just get there quick enough. F physically, they just cannot make it fast enough. These dudes are running across 70 yards of a field with their equipment. If seconds are of the essence, that sometimes may take too long. The minute and 40 that they took, thankfully was not. And like, but like I said, if I'm coaching kids, that minute 40 is too long and calling an ambulance and waiting, that's too long. Because this can happen to pretty much anybody, it's something that is worth all of us taking a little note away from football now into our daily lives. I would basically just say, everyone, get an understanding for what to do in this situation. You don't need to be a doctor to be able to potentially save someone's life. And that is something that is really, really important for all of us in society. And then to be able to watch what it means to everyone to save someone's life. What it means for all of the fans, what it meant for all the players to stick together and just hope. Um, so, th look, th there was uh, it was an emotionally draining day. I'm very excited for tomorrow because <laughs> tomorrow is a brand new clean slate of football and it gets us going back in the right direction, knowing that at this point Christian Eriksen is okay. I don't know what this means for his playing career. I really, really hope that, you know, they find out sort of in a general way what happened and that he can go again because he's still a young man and it, it, this it would be sad for this to have been the final time he kicks a ball at the top level. So everybody, just take stock of all the things in your life tonight. Be grateful for your family. Be grateful for your friends. Be grateful for this game because – I got really emotional a few times watching the images of the fans, um, of the players binding together, and it was just a nice moment to be a football fan again. I mean, it, it, this was sort of like when fans came together for the Super League, and you got this feeling like, you know, we're all, we all believe in, and feel the same things. And, and I think today, great example of that, solidarity with solidarity we get from loving this game and knowing what's important because it really does help us have perspective, give us joy, and also, like like I said earlier, heal some scars and wounds because today we all took a little bit of a beating. And obviously, thoughts, prayers, whatever is your way of saying it, go out to Christian Erickson and his family and the friends and everyone involved. Thank you, Romo Lukaku, for your tribute during the game. We needed someone to do that. This is, this is what football is about. So thanks for stopping by, everyone. This is Campfire Football, and for these Euros, I will be back tomorrow, every day. Every day, I will help you guys out get, get through this. <laughs> thanks so much for stopping by.